One more instance, we were playing Detroit. I was on the bench. Wayne and Yari, Detroit was mugging, holding. And I stood up on the bench and I yelled, Yari, get off. And Yari looked and came to the bench. I jumped on. I was on the ice for maybe 15 seconds. And I went up to Gerard Gallant and I said, and he looks at me and says, what are you doing here? And I said, I've come to kill you. <laughs> and he quickly went off the ice and I went, on, went back to the bench. Yari jumped back on. And I think our bench, Detroit's bench, kind of knew that I was going to get out there any time that I wanted. But to have the freedom to kind of grow as a player and, and that attitude of looking after the guys and being part of the guys, I think really kind of solidified me as an NHL player those moments. How many times did Slats yell at Yell at, uh, Slats had a funny way that he would yell sometimes at the guys that may be playing the least. Or I got cut one night in Boston, cut for six stitches. Kenny Linsman got me right above the eye, right in the eyelid. And after the game, Slats just ripped on me and ripped on me and ripped on me. And I think what he was doing was letting all the other guys know, I'm going to pick on somebody who was hurt and didn't play that much to make all the rest of you guys feel bad. So we all go out, we have a beer together, and we're grumbling about Slats, but the team was so close. You know, and that's the one thing. I walked into a locker room of great, great players, but they were better people. They were such great people. And third and fourth line guys, which didn't happen in, in the other teams I was with, really cheered for each other. Like Semenk and Davey Hunter, and those guys really wanted everybody to do well. And you cheered for guys in their first goals and big games. And it, it was such a fostering environment for a young player. Glenn sometimes would practice me with Mark and, and Glenn Anderson and I wouldn't play the game with them. But he knew I wanted to get better, so I would be out there in practice trying to keep up to those two, and especially at the start, the three of us would start, and by the end, I'm trying to catch up to them any way that I can on the drills and practice. But our practices were faster than a lot of the other, the other teams could play in games. So it, it, you quickly adapt, and you get better, and you get better, and it was just so much fun. I was having so much fun practicing with this hockey team here. There's times I would go over to Nate or University of Alberta after practice and practice with them later in the afternoon because 22, 23 years old, having the time of your life around the best people in the world. The fans, Marty, do you recall? That of course, the team was great when you came in and you guys had a lot of success on the ice. A lot of players have talked about how they really felt part of the community. When did you feel like the fans appreciated Marty? You know, it was funny because right away when you get there, Paul Coffey says, hey, listen, you know, you need a car to drive, takes you over to a dealership, and one of the guys running the dealerships, hey, how you doing? Great to see you. Introduces you to everybody at the dealership. Here, here's a car to drive for three or four weeks till you get on your feet here. Mark Messe is on you. You're not staying in the, host, in the hotel. You're staying at my house. You've got his family. Mark had such a great connection with the community and so many people within the community. And that was also important for Glenn Saylor that we were put into a position where, you know, we're out with the, with the people in the business community here, sharing stories, sharing times. We, he had a real sense of community and you know Glenn Sather, Mark Massey, Grant Fuhr grew up just out on the outskirts of Edmonton so that connection with the community we had a great relationship with the Eskimos obviously with Kevin Lowe's brother but the, es the relationship with guys like Danny Kepley and Neil Lumsden and those guys was really really special so you fit right in you know and, and guys like Al Hamilton and veterans who are living in the community were always welcome in the locker room and they kind of helped solidify our presence in the, in the a little bigger than Glenn Saylor used to kick me out of the weight room in 1987. He used to say, don't lift any weights. You're going to lose flexibility, lose speed. Now look what they're having the kids do today. <laughs> What's it like to walk into Rex all these years later, even today when you come in here and knowing that the new rink's coming up? You know, I sneak back quite often. I come back, Jason knows, we play in a lot of the charity events. I come back up. The Oilers have been very, very good to me. I still cheer for them. I try to get my, my son to wear his Oilers jersey. He'll put the Kings jersey on every now and then. But I still cheer for them. So I sneak into the bu building here. I'm probably at three or four games a year. Or I'll sit in the stands with the fans, watch the game, get an, a, a feel for it. I met a bunch of the people in the business community in L.A. two weeks ago. They were down, the Oilers Foundation. I had a chance to spend some time with them. So I still feel I have a connection. So I walk in the rink. I'm proud of the young guys. These are really, really good young men that are playing the game. I've got to know a few of them. Not really, really well, but well enough to know that, boy, they're, they're putting it in their heart and their soul into it. And I cheer for them. I really do. part of the attraction of this building. Gene, good, good morning, by the way. Good to see you, too. Um, just the, the great, like the building is great, but the history of it, the wins and the cups, yeah. it kind of adds to the, the aura of this building. Whatever the name was, it, you know, that's what happened. You know, um, 
I've gone through that in Los Angeles where, you know, we didn't win a Stanley Cup down there, but the Forum, they don't play out of the Forum anymore. And, you know, when I go into Staples Center, there is a little bit of a connection lost. I, I'm going to be perfectly honest. For me to come to Rexall, you know, tonight and, and be here, I brought my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old. I want them to be here with me. Uh, after the St. Louis Blues are off the ice, I want to take my kids out on the ice, even if it's for five, ten minutes, to take a look around and see the jerseys, kind of get the presence and feel of, of what it was like. And, you know, they've seen pictures of when my dad came on the ice in 1987. So I, I want them to get a feel for it. Um, I'm really going to miss it because it was a big part of, of me growing up, you know, as, as developing as a player. And it's, it's really, really special. It really is. Do you have the most memorable goal? Oh uh, boy! Well, I, I'm the, there was an instance where Big Larry Playfair in Buffalo came in, and and I went right out and grabbed Larry, at, you know, because Larry was going to pose his will and really very honest, respectful player, Larry. But I remember after that, Mark was like, "Wow, right? Well done, right?" There was another instance where. Um, Mike Kruslinski got hurt and was, uh, we're playing Quebec Nordiques, but it was a really, really borderline hit and Mark, Mike got hurt and I went out and, and you get into a big fight and, and what it does is it just kind of, I think it changes the game and it and just keeps your team sky high from a standpoint that we're going to be able to win however a team wants to play. And, and for me, it was a real luxury of playing on this team because I didn't look for fights, I didn't want to change the game. If the other team put me into a position where I had to stick up for my guys and get the game back for us, give us the, the ability to say we can play in the alley if we need to. So, you know, when you're losing 2 nothing or 3 nothing after the first and second period on a losing team, boy, that's a tough job. You're on a team that's winning and scoring eight or nine goals. It's, it's a great opportunity. And Glenn Sather really understood the role of a, phys of a physical player. He knew I was willing to do that, so he cheered for me to be a player. He would give me the second half of a power play if I had a big fight to, you know, to try to get to help my teammates out. So I really felt like my job was important. And Mark and Wayne would be in the locker room and time and time again say we cannot win without the third and the fourth lines. We cannot win if, if somebody is failing somewhere. We need everybody to be really good. We need big goals from third and fourth line guys. And, um, you know, when we were playing Calgary in, 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 in a playoff series, I made a pass to Tick and Tick scored a goal. And I'm, Wayne kind of really made a point of saying that's a big goal for us and really kind of brings it up. But I think game seven, or sorry, game five against Philadelphia, I was able to get two goals, and I, it's Glenn was putting me out with Gretz a fair bit. And so when that season ended, I set my goals higher. I changed my goals because we won a Stanley Cup with what you dream about. But then at that point, I had to reach for more. I had to aim for more, and, and it, I think that game was something that, you know, those that playoff series for me was something that was, uh, oh, boy, I'll always, I'll always remember and always cherish. Were you the first star of that game? 